Hey, it's Matt Bodner, private equity investor, former Goldman Sachs and Forbes 30 under 30 alum. Today, I've got Joe Fear on the show, and we talk about how to build an audience from scratch. Great conversation on audience building. With that, let's jump right in so you can get these lessons from Joe. Joe, welcome to the Science of Success. Hey, Matt. Thanks for having me here. Well, we're super excited to have you on the show today and dig into a little bit more kind of business-focused content than we typically focus on the show. But I think this is going to be a really insightful conversation for the listeners, and, and I think we can pull a lot of really good insights out of this. Yeah. Yeah. We were just doing that pre-talk, and there's a lot of overlap. <laughs> yeah, we might have to we might have to release the pre-show conversation as a little piece of bonus content or maybe we'll play it after <laughs> the credits roll for those of you who want to stick around. Right on. But I'm curious, you know, I mean it's it's such a fascinating skill set and I mean obviously we spend a lot of time thinking about digital marketing kind of on the back end of of science of success as well. But I'm curious what was the and or or was there kind of an inflection point in your career where you where things really started to click or you really started to figure out what actually drives growth online? What actually makes companies or businesses scale in a digital way? Yeah, that's a good question. And it took a while. And ironically, we started with it, but then I kind of diverted a little ways away from the core thing. And I believe it's content, is producing the best possible content. Like you guys are with this podcast. We do that with our show as well. And you know, we started off blogging just in different niches and kind of learning And we always shared our results. And that's exactly what we're doing with the podcast still. And I know you guys do the same thing. So giving that value in terms of a good piece of content there and then putting it out to the world and then doing that. So that's our focus is content development and creation and using that around all of our marketing. And then that just pairs up and then allows our network to grow. So again, the podcast is a perfect part of that as well. But I believe it starts with content. That's kind of the inflection point. I diverted a lot into one-on-one stuff, you know, cons- consulting and, and kind of agency work. And we've moved more into like, hey, the foundation needs to be content because that's going to attract the right people that you want to work with. Kind of weeds out a lot of the tire kickers that might not be the best time for them to take an action with you. But, you know, through the content, at least there's value that they're going to get from there. And they might tell some of their friends and refer the qualified folks your way. So that's that's really the key is producing the great content that really flows from you, not something that you should try to force yourself into. So podcasting is great. We love to talk and, you know, that can get produced into videos and transcripts and notes and, you know, newsletters and all sorts of cool things. But that's where I believe it starts for us. So... I think that's a piece of advice that you hear a lot. And I feel like many people create content. It may not be high quality content, which could be part of the problem and probably is. But I feel like there's so many content creators out there who create a bunch of content. They think it's awesome. They kind of put it out there and you know, a lone tumbleweed blows by and <laughs> nobody really sees it. So you know, it, it's almost a chicken and the egg type of situation. Like if you have great content or you think you're creating high quality content, how do you actually get people to start listening to it, start paying attention to it? How do you get it in front of folks? Because I know growing traffic is is obviously a huge component of, of what's made you guys so successful. And so you realized that content was super important. And then how did you start to really get distribution for that content and get traffic and get it in front of people? Yeah. So we started off in, and this is where we kind of began. So back in the day, we started about 2010 marketing online in the blogging days. And it, to be honest, it, you know, the modalities have changed a little bit, but attracting the right people into Kickstart content hasn't changed a lot. We started in forum marketing, so actually giving value, responding to people's questions. And, you know, in there, we would drop a link to a post that we might have written, or maybe it's in our footer, something that linked to our, to our property where the content was housed. Now, this day, so like when we kickstarted our podcast, let's say, what we went to our network and we went to all of these different places that we know we have some influence or at least we can attach ourselves to a community that is talking about the similar topics. So today, a really good thing, we're actually starting to experiment a lot with Reddit. So in the podcasting space, that's something we're starting to morph more into is podcast marketing. We're doing some different things in that regard. So on Reddit, Matt's kind of, you know, my partner, Matt Wolf, is kind of heading this up a little bit more because he just nerds out on that stuff, is giving value in those communities. And so Reddit's great for that. Quora is amazing. We've interviewed a 
bunch of uh, content producers. And one of the daily actions that a lot of these folks do is hit Quora, give value on there, answer questions, and then have a link back to a piece of content that you produce. And it could be anything, YouTube videos, podcasts, that blog, whatnot. Facebook groups are amazing. If you can create these relationships and these groups that really value good content, and especially on these you know, Facebook groups, people are very protective over the type of stuff that's posted. Reddit, definitely. Quora as well. As long as you can find these buckets of audiences, it always starts with audiences. And then just figure out how to interject some kind of or inject some kind of value in there with the content that you produce. And then just keep the consistency up. You can't do like a one shot and then just kind of hope that it's going to take off. Uh, The idea is to always kind of make it a daily checklist, something on that list that you're just taking the box. All right. Posted something in Reddit or you just answered someone's question. That's really a great way. And then once you build up a network, so that's great for someone starting out. The network, you know, like for a podcast or if you tag someone in something, always getting someone to share that whole virality factor, it's it's extremely valuable. Again, it's not going to be a massive push, but if you can pair that up with some paid traffic, so that's what we really love to do. There's a lot of different strategies you can do in all of these places where you can spend a pretty minimal budget just to kickstart a piece of content. Even with Reddit, there's Reddit ads, Quora ads, Facebook ads, of course, do a lot on Google as well. And you could do these for as little as a dollar or $5 a day to kickstart a piece of content. And then from there, you can kind of just compound your efforts with more content or maybe more ad budget and more value to give to these communities. That's really interesting. And there's a couple of different things I want to understand about that. I definitely want to dig into kickstarting content with with a small paid spend because I, I think that's a topic that's really, really interesting. But before we do, you know, one of the struggles, and this is just something personally that we've we've encountered uh, along our kind of growth trajectory is when we were early on, you know, we haven't done a lot of kind of Reddit and, and Facebook marketing, but I've spent a huge amount of time on Quora, which we got a lot of traffic from. But you know, when I would go to a place like Reddit and go into some of the subreddits that that were affiliated with things like Science of Success, and I, you know, I would maybe I just didn't understand the the reticent or whatever of, of how to do it appropriately. You know, I would post something that I think is super valuable, and I mean, I I truly believe in the content we're creating. I think it's amazing. I think it's really life changing, and we have tons and tons of people who email us and tell us that. And yet, I would I would come in and say like, hey, you should check this out. Like, this is a great interview with this world class expert about this thing, and like, here's the things you should do. And I got banned from like three subreddits for self promotion. And so after that, I was just like, you know, fuck Reddit. Like, I'm not going to waste any time on here. And so, what I mean, have you ever had that experience, or how do you kind of thread that needle to where you don't get banned from self promoting? Because I feel like some of those communities, like Reddit and some Facebook groups, are so edgy about like you can't post a link to your own content, and yet. You know, it's it's like, well, what if it's actually really good content? What if it's directly relevant to what you're talking about? It's true. I mean, Reddit is the, that's probably the most difficult place to self promote, and that's where you have to really. It's interesting. It's like these are all little communities. You have to build your own cred before you start linking to something of your own, or really anything at that, because you know you never know how you're tied into that piece of content. So with Reddit, definitely every subreddit has its own rules. So knowing what those rules are, I believe on the right side, if you're on the, you know, on the browser online, they always have all the different terms that that Reddit owner or subreddit owner is kind of looking out for. And all those other, you know, people have joined that Reddit, they're going to support that. I mean, these people are by the book, you know, rules, (laughs) they're rabid, man. So if you, if you piss someone off, yeah, it's very highly likely you're either going to get booted or downvoted, which screws up your karma on Reddit. That's kind of how they they judge things there. So like with us, we'll go to the podcasting Reddit and just purely answer questions and without any links or anything like that. And really, if you just do that, I would say for just a handful of weeks and you know some of that content, the answer should come from your other content that you produced. That's typically what we do. So it's a it's a way to repurpose what we're already creating. But over time, we have definitely noticed you know people start sharing it or they'll start you know upvoting it so it gets a little bit more traction. And some people we've seen now starting to post it to other subreddits. So then the the idea is to kind of get other people to do that work for you. 
but there's not a lot of shortcutting, you know, the the self-promotion or you can't just start dropping links left and right. Same with Quora as well. And Facebook groups, same with Reddit groups. I mean, all these things, if you can get to know the the owner or the one, some of the moderators and really create a relationship there because you know, whoever owns that audience, that's the person you really got to get in with. Of course, you can create your own groups, you can create your own subreddit and all that stuff, but then you got to actually work to build your own audience. If you have your own subreddit, I mean, you own the rules. Like we have our own for the podcast and it's a slow growth, but definitely, you know, anything goes if you, if you hold the rules to that group. But I would say there's a lot of opportunity on Facebook groups for this, and it's probably a little easier than Reddit if you're just starting out. I hope you're enjoying this interview. If you are, you might enjoy my free newsletter, The Deal Mastery Insider, where we talk about buying businesses, scaling companies, and doing deals. The link to join is in my bio or at mattbodner.com slash newsletter. And when you sign up, you also get my free email course on how to buy a business. I hope you check it out. And with that, Let's get back to the show. That's actually a really, really key point and something that I hadn't thought of from a strategic standpoint, which is targeting and getting to know the the moderators or the owners of those, whether it's a sub or a Facebook group or whatever. And I mean, if you're somebody who has credibility in your space, right? I mean, if we were to email somebody who's who has a personal development subreddit and be like, hey, here's what we do. Here's who we are. Here's who we've interviewed, etc. It's probably pretty easy to have a conversation and just you know, talk to them on Skype for 30 minutes, build that relationship, start adding value. And then suddenly when you get engaged in that subreddit, they're way less likely to be like, well, who the fuck is this guy banned? Yeah, exactly. Dude, it's all about relationships. And that's where, or you can even invite some of those folks on the show. You know, we're always trying to look for win-wins, ways to give back to them. You know, if they're struggling to make money, which a lot of these group owners are, you know, if they don't know how to monetize or if they don't have their own content, you can be that content arm for them or somehow figure out a, a rev split on whatever it might be you bring to the table there. Any kind of win-win, you're always looking for, they have the audience you want. So that's your win. You know, you just got to figure out what is the win that they're really going to freaking jump over and jump backwards over for. And I think you nailed it, man. Hop on Skype for just a few minutes. You could bang that out and figure out what are their desires. And then from there, it's just all about giving value to their people. Super smart. So I want to come back to the paid ads to content piece because I've heard some previous rules of thumb or ideas around, you know, if you spend X on a piece of content, you should spend Y promoting it. What is your thought process or strategy? How do you typically kickstart a piece of content with, with a little bit of paid promotion? How do you think about budgeting that? And what platforms have you seen to be the most effective? Let's focus on Facebook first. And we interviewed a guy named Dennis Yu. So this is kind of his strategy. And it's been morphed around by a bunch of people. But this is kind of our perpetual strategy to target ads to an audience that's really going to sync up well with the piece of content. So case in point is our, our podcast, we have a lot of guests who are targets on Facebook or their companies are. And what we'll do is we'll have, you know, Roland Frazier, we talked about him you know, on the pre-talk here. I believe now he is a target, but prior to that, Digital Marketer was the target that we were using. And in Facebook, you can target that that audience, so Digital Marketer or you know Roland Frazier, and for a dollar a day with these ads, you can put a link or, you know, for us, it's basically just the show notes image. And that'll target their audience. So for a dollar a day, Facebook's going to try to squeeze out as much of those impressions for that dollar a day. So, you know, Facebook wants you to be successful with their ads, as does any other platform out there. So if you could target perpetually a dollar a day for someone or their audience, you know, it could be their company, the, the name, or even a related audience, if you can think a little laterally, and then sync that up to a piece of content that those folks are going to love. For a dollar a day, you can kind of appear that you're everywhere to that audience. And so that's why we, we get a lot of messages about like, oh, I found you from Facebook, you know, because I just saw you kind of stalking me on there. But that was a strategic target. So we'll actually do that for every single one of our guests who has a, a direct target on Facebook. And that works really well. In addition to that, so we do uh, Google ads as well. And this is a little bit more of an elaborate strategy, but we'll try to figure out what keywords people are searching for around our piece of content. So we'll kind of start with a broad keyword, run some ads just to get clicks, 
and then we'll figure out what keywords are starting to come in a little bit more consistently. And ideally, it's not going to be a broad keyword because those are competitive. Spend about $100 to get this data from Google. And then from there, we'll take some of these keywords that are maybe a little bit more niche down. You know, they're a little longer. So folks aren't typically bidding on these keywords. But that's where we can really shine a light on, you know, run an ad. And usually we're the only ones there. And our content synced up perfectly. It usually has a similar keyword. We'll title the, the piece of content almost identical to the ad. So it's super congruent. You always want to do that with all of your ads. You know, what I described there on Facebook and then also Google, those are our two biggest strategies. So every day we're running low budget ads to kind of like an initial piece of content. And if they don't take an action, which we're always looking for them to join our email list at a very minimum so we can do our follow-ups. But if they don't do that, then we have all of our retargeting ads running again, you know, just very targeted. To, so if they, they touched our website in any which way, they're going to see maybe some videos from MatterEye, some other content, some podcasts. It's, we're just trying to grow that trust. So it's a multi-touch process until we kind of get that conversion or whatever we're trying to get them to do either buy a product or join a list, something like that. I would say those two are like the 80-20. That's the 80% of, of where we're focused on right now. Yeah, that's so smart. And it makes total sense. I mean, we, you know, we were talking in the pre-show, I think about a, a recent guest we had on our show, Brene Brown. Like she's obviously a target on Facebook, or I would assume she is because she's big enough. And so if we were to just take our Brene Brown show notes, and, and I'm curious how you would how you would think about this, but basically, if I'm describing this correctly, you basically take the show notes for the Brene Brown episode. You make sure, and I want to unpack a little bit, kind of how you how you sync that up with an email opt in, and then you basically run a dollar a day Facebook ad targeting Brene Brown people who like Brene Brown, and boom, 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 you're there, you're you know omnipresent, and obviously those people are already going to be predisposed to liking your content. Hundred percent, you nailed it, and that's what we do. Is we now we're starting to do more of the we call them cheat sheets, but yeah, you can do you know, show notes, anything that's going to grab that audience's attention. And it's even better if yeah, you show them, hey, here's a, an exclusive interview, or or maybe it's a transcript or some kind of notes from Brene talking about X topic. More than likely, someone you know, you're going to get a lot of people from their audience start to. It's not a flood; it's a trickle approach, which is good. Because that allows you to test and to kind of optimize your conversions if you're trying to get them on an email list, which I would definitely want them to do. Or if you were to do that, I would definitely suggest doing that. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we had a big, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but we had a big strategic shift probably two years ago with the podcast where we basically realized like before that we were, we were going to conferences and events, talking to people and we were like, you know, hey, we're a podcast. We want to get more podcast subscribers, build more listenership. And we basically had this complete strategic flip of the way we perceived it was like, no, we're a media company. And what we really need to do is get email subscribers. And currently, the way we deliver content and value to them is through primarily a podcast, but not exclusively. And so we completely shifted our strategy and went from having, you know, like maybe sub two or 3,000 email subs to having, you know, almost 50,000 email subs by just pivoting our strategy nice. towards, towards focusing on that. Oh, dude, that's so valuable. And you nailed it. You said a media company. That that was actually a shift that Matt and I took maybe two years ago, I would say, because in, in the podcast, like it is for you guys, leads like that's the, at the top of the media company. And, you know, for if you think in media companies, someone's like, oh, how do I have a media company? Well, any content is a media company thing you know like you you can be on all these different platforms if you're leveraging podcasts cool there's your media platform there youtube facebook google all of these things are collectively they have this reach and then with that reach if you could just figure out how to kind of funnel them into with the value we're always leading with content and value but bring them to the email list that's where all of our money is made is on the follow-up so like we were talking about you, know, you asked me how we monetize our podcast. Well, that's exactly it. It's not usually right there on the first touch. It's, you know, maybe the third, seventh touch. And that sounds like a lot, but you can automate a lot of those touches, just bringing them back to more content. Then sooner or later, you know, if you, if you have all these different, you know, entry points on your show notes pages, on landing pages, anywhere out there on your podcast as well with a special URL to a landing page, that just optimizes your your opportunity to capture these folks on the list. And retargeting is a whole nother bucket too. Like that's 
we call them owned audiences. So anything that you have control and can follow up with folks could be email lists, chat bots, even retargeting podcasts are great. There's even push crew, you know, pu- uh, push notifications on, on browsers. All of these are things that you have control to follow up with. And, you know, it's just going to increase the opportunity for you to convert them into a sale of something, whatever you're looking to do. We talk a lot on the science of success about the importance of your time. I'm always on the hunt for tools and resources that will save me time and produce better results. That's why I'm such a big fan of our sponsor this week, LinkedIn Jobs. One of my favorite stats about LinkedIn Jobs is that every eight seconds, someone is hired on their platform. LinkedIn Jobs screens candidates with the hard and soft skills that you're looking for so you can find the right person quickly. And you can screen for intangible job skills and abilities, not just looking at a flat, one-dimensional resume. The deep data set and massive amount of people on LinkedIn creates a powerful amount of information that you can use to make it easy and effortless to find the right hires for your business. Find the right person meant for your business today with LinkedIn Jobs. You can pay what you want and the first $50 is on them. Just visit linkedin.com slash success. Again, that's linkedin.com slash success to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. So I want to unpack a couple pieces of this and, and get super granular for a second. So when you're thinking about the ad that you're running to, let's say, a show notes page, is it actually just straight up the show notes page or is it a landing page that the number one thing is you're trying to convert them to an email opt in in order to get access to a guide to the show notes or whatever? Or is it, hey, here's the show notes page. Here's the episode. You might like it. And by the way, join the email list. Yeah. So there's two steps there. So with uh, let's go back to the Brene Brown example that you said. So if you wanted to attract new people, these are people who have not listened to the show yet, and you're just trying to attract a new audience to come listen and then go down the wormhole with you guys, that would be where I would run these dollar a day ads, target Brene Brown on Facebook, and then use the dollar a day strategy and point them to a show notes page. Because that's, you know, that's, there's no commitment on the person's part. And, you know, the new person that you're attracting there, they, they have the opportunity to check out the show notes page, maybe read it, listen to the episode. They could join the email list if they choose to. They probably won't off the first touch. But, you know, you never know. There is a percentage that will take you up. But then to bring them back, you have the whole retargeting phase. You want to make sure that you're following up on anyone who lands on one of your properties. And that's even clicking an ad. You know, if, uh, if that ad goes to anywhere else, even someone else's site, you could retarget. So what I would do is to the warm approach. So the cold approach was to use the dollar a day and send to show notes. But the cold approach, what we would do is run an ad that if you wanted to get super targeted, you would do something like, here are the exclusive uh, notes. Like this is what we do is typically we took the notes on this Brene Brown episode for you. If you click this, you'll get it for absolutely free. And what that would direct them to is to a landing page. Now, only option there is to join our email list to get that thing for free. So that would be the warm approach with retargeting on Facebook. You could do that on Google as well. And I believe Reddit, even if you want an experiment with that, is starting to come out with some retargeting ads. So those are the two approaches I would take for those. So basically... You start out, you drive cold traffic to the dollar a day to the landing page for the general show notes. And then for the people who haven't joined the email list, you're retargeting them. Hey, here's an exclusive guide, checklist, whatever, show notes, et cetera. You know, click here to get them completely free. And then that's where you're sort of hitting them after they've been warmed up a little bit. They've see, they've at least clicked to your landing page previously. That's when you're driving specifically for the email opt-in. A hundred percent. Yeah. And and what you could do, and this is a more elaborate approach, but if they're not taking you up for a certain period of time, there's a lot of things you can do in Facebook, you know, for certain time periods, run this ad. So let's say, you know, in the first week or so, if they landed on the Brene Brown show notes page, but didn't join the email list, you can run ads with retargeting to just get them with the objective to actually join the list. But maybe after that point, they don't take an action. Now you can just kind of follow up with other episodes that you guys release. 
and those are all retargeting ads. They could point to other show notes pages. Maybe there's some videos that you have you can upload on Facebook. There's a lot of ways to repurpose your episodes and make you know a good visual around it on Facebook and Instagram because they're all connected. And again, it's like repetition. The more and more they see your brand, your face, your name, the different guests you've had, your show, uh, your podcast logo. Over and over, like we hear it all the time. They're like, man, we see your stuff everywhere. You know, like you guys are video machines or whatever. You know, it's like, no, they're just, we just have a bucket of about, you know, maybe 10 to 20 assets and these ads that just rotate in this pool of people. If they haven't taken the desired action, they're just going to see our brand. So maybe that one thing didn't resonate, but maybe one of these other 20 things do. And each one of those things have a low budget. So it's not like we're spending, you know, $100 per ad. It might just be $2, let's say, per ad or even a dollar ad. And they're just rotating around. So you're just increasing your odds is really all you're trying to do. And so what are you what are you targeting for kind of a, I mean, you touched on this a second ago, but what are you what are you aiming for from a retargeting budget standpoint? If you're spending a dollar a day on the cold traffic, how much are you allocating to retargeting? So that's totally up to you. The, the minimum you could spend on Facebook, for example, is a dollar per day for your budget. So we always suggest to kind of start low and then work your way up as you see maybe the frequency is getting higher or you're, you're just not getting the desired action. It's, it's almost like a pool of ads. And you can, like for us, we'll have about 10 at a minimum of any time. And then we'll essentially assign a budget to each one of those ads. So call it a dollar a day to start. Facebook's just going to kind of rotate around depending on what, you know, in that pool, they kind of decide what ad to show depending on the frequency that it's been shown and the budget you have allocated. You kind of just let their algorithm do the work for you on the retargeting play, which is kind of nice. So you can, it's, it's kind of up to you again for, for ramping up the budget. The more budget you, you increase, of course, your ads are going to show more. But yeah, I mean, that's that's kind of it. There are definitely a lot of nuts and bolts to it. But at a good understanding level, I'd say that's kind of what you want to be thinking of is there, these are these pools and Facebook, give them enough kind of ammunition to work with or you know budget to work with. And they're going to squeeze the most results that they possibly can out of what you give them. And this is maybe a hyper specific question, but are you personally executing, going into Facebook, doing this stuff? Or do you have a consultant, an outsourcer, somebody that you bring in to actually execute the the ad setup and, and everything for you? Yeah. So right now, Matt is the one that heads up all of that. So yeah, that's why like in the granular details, he's going to be the one to really, really go into the weeds on it. So he manages, I would say, about 60% of the ads, but we get direct consulting from a good buddy of ours, Kurt Molly, Kurt Molly out of Austin. So he advises a lot of large brands. So every single week, we're getting kind of told what to do with the latest things happening on Facebook. You know, like, hey, here, test this video 15 seconds or, or less, use it in in stream ads. This is really killing it right now. Go try this out. So we kind of take direction from them, him and his team, but we're always experimenting as well from people on our podcast. Like I mentioned, Dennis Yu, like our episode, he he pretty late, he pretty much lays out that entire process for the dollar a day ads. And a lot of this stuff is simple enough to just set up yourself and you don't need to get too crazy. I would say if you could just figure out dollar a day ads, anyone can set those up and, and set your targeting and make sure, you know, your budgets are right. You're not going to spend way too much, you know, for whatever result you're trying to get, and then set up some simple retargeting to just follow up and again, set a budget you're comfortable with, and then let it run for a week or two. That's, that's kind of like, again, 80, 20, that's, that's usually what businesses should be doing at a minimum. And, and most every business owner can kind of learn those basics and do it themselves. But we are starting to transition away from Matt doing the ads because, yeah, that's not his best use of time, but he just loves it so much. He has that mind. He just nerds out with it. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. I'm just curious. I'm always curious about how the actual tactical, concrete implementation of this looks on the back end. Yeah. Yeah. He's definitely... So like in our partnership, I'm definitely more of the visionary strategy him and I both do. But I'll, I'll kind of do more of the experimenting, the ideas, the, the networking, and, and kind of figuring out the general landscape of things. And then once we have something we agree upon, Matt's the one that 
has the systems analytical brain and he'll just freaking go down a wormhole. He'll come up with the strategy step by step. Cause like, I'm not, my brain isn't the sequential thinker that he is. That's why we make, I think a pretty damn good <laughs> partnership. And others have said that actually, like I Dennis, you, he's like, you guys are like a two headed dragon. <laughs> you know, one can go run away and do this kind of thing. While Matt's over here behind the computer, freaking busting out a crazy automation that we can then replicate and send to our team to kind of manage the day to day. So that's kind of how we split up our duties and how we can, seems like we do a lot, but a lot of it can be automated once you set up the system. And that's usually Matt, the one to do that. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And so you touched on this a little bit, but from a high level standpoint, how do you think about monetizing the podcast audience? And I guess, I mean, there's this is sort of a multi-pronged question, but is the podcast the primary driver of leads and opportunities for the entire economic engine that you guys have developed? Or is it just a piece that's sort of a, a plug and play or a satellite that sits on top of a larger business infrastructure? Yeah, good question. So the podcast definitely has become our number one driver for all content, traffic, all of the above. And mainly because it can be repurposed in so many different ways. So our podcast, like we were saying, is about, it's two times a week is the show gets released. And they're about an hour long on average. And from that point, you know, we always have a note taker taking notes on every single one of these things. I don't know if you ever saw the traffic and conversion notes that get released. We basically took a note taker that used to work for that company and that she now works for us to take these notes. So these are like four page notes. These things can get repurposed into all sorts of different content on social media, shareables and repurposed with all these different apps, transcripts are, are part of that as well. And, you know, that then turns into, so from the podcast, we're always trying to direct people who listen to our show notes page. And sometimes we actually send them to just a companion sheet, kind of starting to experiment with that. It's tough to track, you know, from podcasts, which I'm sure you're, you're very well aware. It's kind of an interesting space where we're always experimenting and figuring out what works best. But at a minimum, we're always trying to direct people from the podcast to our show notes page, because once they land on the show notes page, they have the opportunity to opt into our email list. They can click on any one of the many links and of resources we mentioned on the show, but also it allows us to retarget those folks. And that is the number one way we get people on an email list to then follow up with them with affiliate offers. We also have a, a membership that's a monthly recurring product, 20, uh, or sorry, 15 bucks a month. So we're trying to do a very low level subscription so we get some recurring income for ourselves that we control. But then on the back end of that, there's all sorts of different affiliate offers, which we typically average about $100 per commission, a little bit more, depending on the, the actual offer. And that is kind of our monetization right there. And that's kind of the process. So we have the podcast all the way into show notes with a call to action on the podcast that directs them to the show notes. And then from there, the idea is to get them on an email list. And that's, that's kind of our traffic. That's our content generator. That's our machine right there. And if you were to say, and if you're not comfortable sharing, that's totally fine. But I'm just curious, at a very high level, like what percent of your monetization is affiliate offers versus sort of house offers versus consulting and work outside of offers made to the list? Yeah, no, that's a great question, man. I'm happy to answer. So for the longest time, I'd say for two years, when we were kind of starting the show and figuring this all out, affiliate income was about 80%, which is cool, but also scary as hell because we're <laughs> kind of building someone else's business. And, you know, we're at the whim of if they change an offer that conversions could tank, meaning our income can tank too. Luckily that never really happened. You know, we get some little blurbs here and there, but right now it's about 50, 50. So we're actively trying to, like I was saying, get people in this membership, which allows us, and this is what gets a little interesting, and this is something we learned from Roland actually, is if we can create all these different buckets and control attention more or less, starting with the podcast, you know, now we're bringing them into a membership site, which we can follow up with just our customers, show them exclusive content, maybe some affiliate offers. And it also allows us sponsorship opportunities. It's just, if we're going back to the media company concept, 
we now have the opportunity to get a sponsor for not only the podcast, but we have banners on our sites that we can rotate and, you know, we can limit the amount of impression. So if we're guaranteeing a certain amount, we can say that and we can actually show them proof of it as well. But then we also have our membership area. We can create a sponsored area, which we have with a piece of content and a special offer. And the same with our physical newsletter that we send in the mail. We can give inserts in there or they can even purchase a spot to mail that list with our endorsement. And it's interesting because we can create now sponsorship packages and show the value and the results are much better than if you know someone just bought ad space on the actual website with banners or even on the podcast. The results are much, much better with all these different buckets that we have influence over. So it's it's really cool. You know, the idea is with this media site, we're creating all these different opportunities for us to essentially monetize without us needing to do a lot more work than we're normally doing. It's kind of found money if you set yourself up for that kind of opportunity. So yeah, the idea is to get away more and more of the, the affiliate. That's more of a you know, byproduct is, is the idea. We want it down to probably 25% ideally of our income. That's really interesting. And so the print newsletter, that's kind of encompassed in the... And sorry, how much did you say per month? 15, 25? 15. 15. Yeah, okay. Month. So $15 a month. What is the value proposition? Because we haven't done anything like that with our audience, but I've always been fascinated by that kind of model and whether there's actually value in it. And so what is the value proposition to the audience? And is the print newsletter included as part of that? It is. So that it started off with just the print. So we know our cost is about... And we ship all over the world. It's just one flat rate. So it's around $8 per person. So obviously not a lot of profit there. The idea is to you know get folks to really see the repetition and set ourselves up with the affiliate income, sponsorship income, and all that all that stuff. So the value prop is typically the folks hearing our offer, seeing the offers, hearing us on our podcast, and they want to just dive deeper. So they want to get a higher touch with us. In we have a whole community in there. They can ask questions of us or other people. A lot of our guests will actually go into that community as well because their content lives there. So they can dive, they have the option to dive deeper with them, with their training, actually ask them questions, maybe purchase their product if they want to. But all the way from, I mentioned that we take notes in all of our podcast episodes. What we do is we compile all of those notes into a monthly booklet, more or less. And this thing ranges from about 24 pages to like 30-ish pages. And essentially, it's a way that a lot of folks really love the physical aspect, which is crazy. Because there's a lot of magazines from startups now that are starting to get made. It's almost like this. We're seeing a little bit of a shift back into physical mailings of newsletters and, and magazines. It's just to take people away from the distractions that we're all getting those, you know, the phones ringing or, or another notification on our computer. So a lot of folks really love that physical. They can highlight stuff, dog gear. And it's just a time savings. You know, the idea is to save their time, but also allow them to dive deeper with us is the value prop mainly to the listeners. We have monthly calls as well with extra training and experiments that we're up to and what others are up to on our show. So it's a way for folks to really just stay tapped in for a low dollar amount. And, you know, from there, it opens up all sorts of opportunities for us, of course, like I was mentioning. And yeah, it's an interesting model and we're still tweaking little things here and there. But if you kind of compare it to, say, Blinkist for reading books or all these summary guides you see on Amazon, everyone's just trying to save time. They're, they're digesting content. They want to be in the know, but maybe it's just like a handful of things they want to take away from an episode, not listen to a full hour of the thing, you know, twice a week. That's a huge commitment. So we're trying to kind of bridge that gap there. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And I don't know if you if you follow Tim Ferriss or his stuff at all, but he just recently in the last couple of weeks rolled out a similar test of of his monetization. He actually I think is going no ads and he's doing pay what you think it's worth starting with $10 a month kind of model and testing that for a couple of weeks to see how that compares to his monetization strategy of just sponsorships. Yeah, and that's it's super smart too because the podcasting world CPM. So, you know, it's basically the earnings per download and the pot, it's around $20 if a sponsorship opportunity came your way as a podcaster. 
And I just heard earlier today, it used to be $60. So it keeps going down, unfortunately, for podcasters. But the way to you know circumvent that is to create buckets of your own and a value prop to sponsors like we did, where a software company came to us and they just wanted podcast sponsorship. But what I did, I kind of flipped it. I'm like, hey, well, we have these other buckets. I know they're going to return, you know, give you much better returns than just the podcast sponsorship. And they agreed to it. And I was able to take them away from the CPM model and then give them a just a one flat fee for the, that period of time of sponsorship. So it's way more profitable for us. But I know the benefit to them is going to be much higher as well. So it's just, it's interesting. You know, there's a lot of things you can kind of manipulate. And once you have this media company and these different little buckets that you have influence over, it's just another way to create value. That's all we're trying to do here. And how do you think about the, like, what is the audience that you guys are targeting or serving? How did you, did you intentionally set out to serve a specific niche or a specific set of customers? And how did you select that and begin to focus around targeting that niche? And who is it? Yeah, so it's it's interesting because we started off with just talking to mainly digital marketers, people in our circle. And that's kind of the crew that we've always had and had influence over. So we did that just because it's kind of the language we spoke. And that's the network that we can leverage to kickstart the show. And now it's starting to extend into because of, I think it's really the guests we're bringing on. That's going to attract the, you know, the different audience. So now we're getting a lot more high level companies. We're getting, I mean, it's interesting, a bunch of lawyers, there's different associations. I mean, it, the target is essentially any business who is around a million dollars a year who has a team, you know, minimal team at, as a starting point, but they're, they're looking to take action. They want to not only get the tactics, but they want to see what's behind the hood. And really dig into like the stories and the why and the struggles even. We're trying to always pull out the shit that every entrepreneur has to go through. Our idea is to try to unpack stories and things that are really making our guests tick that aren't normally seen on the stages or on, on any other business podcast out there. It's almost like we're shooting to try to be like the Joe Rogan approach of business, which is an interesting, you know, it's long form, which most business shows, marketing shows are not. And they're usually very tactical, which, you know, we kind of started off that way, but we quickly got bored of that. (laughs) And, you know, we wanted to kind of like what you guys do is get to the root of what is it that makes this thing work or tick. And then, yeah, there's always some practical things that people can apply, kind of like what we've been talking about here. But also, what's the why behind all of this stuff? And it's interesting, man. Like we're now getting, we do some independent shows too. So Matt and I, my co-host will do these things called therapy sessions. And so it's just the two of us and we'll just lay everything out there. The good, the bad, the ugly, we don't care. And there's no censorship. We don't edit anything. And we'll talk about experiments we're doing, what we failed, what we succeeded, all that stuff, future plans. And people absolutely love them. And I feel like those have really helped us grow a better brand. They may not attract more people. I think the bigger names on our show attract the audiences that we're serving now. But it's the ones that really keep people are these therapy sessions because I feel like it's almost like it's therapy for us. That's why we named it, you know, because we're all struggling with similar things. So we just lay it out there and then people email us all the time. They're like, do more of those things. <laughs> you know, like more of you is what we want. And we feel like it's just, it strengthens our brand. That's what gets people reaching out, asking about partnership or advising deals. We do a lot of those now. And that usually comes directly from the podcast. I mean, you guys reached out straight from the podcast straight after listening to Roland. So that's kind of proof in point right there. Yeah, that's really fascinating. I'm curious, what's one of the most common pitfalls or mistakes that you see people making when they're getting started with generating traffic or beginning with digital marketing? I would say it goes back to content for us. And then also trying to get the conversion, like a sales conversion or whatever that end result, way too quickly. So the traffic process that we have, it's a longer term process. And it's kind of what I mapped out with the dollar a day strategy on Facebook and also that Google strategy where we're trying to mine these keywords. The idea that we're trying to do is 
we have a long-term strategy. It's not, you know, we don't like the launch and then the, the drop off. Cause I don't know if you're familiar with the launch model, but you know, that was prevalent maybe about six plus years ago. And it was very good. You know, it raised a lot of money for a company, but then right after that, there was no strategy to retain that attention with something like retargeting, for instance, or even follow-ups in an email. So it's kind of two things is, is have a longer term mindset and know that the content you're putting out in the world will live there for a very, very long time. You know, every piece of content you ever put online. So do your best in terms of creating amazing, valuable content that will last the test of time. Even if it's tactical, you can always go back and update that. But then always try to follow up. It's all about the follow up. I mean, that's most of our money is made on the follow up in all those different ways that we were talking about. And a lot of folks just try to rush it, man. <laughs> they, they try to rush the sale or whatever it is they're trying to do and they become too pushy and they're not leading with value. And then that's where people kind of start going away, looking for other options because you're not quite resonating with where their needs are at. And what would one action item or piece of homework be that you would give to listeners if they wanted to implement some of the things we've talked about today? All right. So a couple ones, I would say, if you don't have an email list, definitely start an email list and create a good opt-in freebie to capture those folks. So figure out whatever it is that audiences you have and the intentions they're seeking. So figure out their pains, their struggles, all that stuff, and then try to come up with a good solution to at least hook them a little bit in the very beginning to give them, and it's all value, obviously, you're not trying to like give them a little portion and then upsell them on the rest. That's kind of a, meh, like, that's not the best way to approach it. But grow an email list, pair it up with a great valuable piece of content. It could be a good checklist, template, whatever it is that's easy to digest. The ebook thing, it's not the best kind of opt-in freebie. So capture your folks with an email list at minimum. And if you do have that, set up this retargeting. I would say that's the lowest you know, barrier to entry to ads is to set up simple Facebook retargeting and just bring people back to a landing page or maybe even just back to a sales page on your website if they visited any one of your pages on your site. And there's a lot of ways to learn that stuff. You know, it was just simple Facebook retargeting. You could set that up in, you know, I don't know, 30 minutes or so, an hour yourself, even when learning. Those two things I would say to start with. Well, Joe, thank you so much for coming on the show, for digging into all these insights, lots of great strategies, tactics, and tools for people who want to grow their businesses. Awesome, Matt. No, this has been really fun. Thanks for having me, dude. Thank you so much for listening to that episode. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you got a lot of actionable takeaways that you can go out and apply and get some results from, from that conversation. If you enjoyed it, check out my newsletter, The Deal Mastery Insider. The link to join is in the description below. We talk about buying businesses, scaling companies, doing deals, and so much more. If you enjoyed this episode, I know you're gonna love all the stuff we talk about in The Deal Mastery Insider, and it's free to join. And if you join now, you get my free course on how to buy a business as well. So check it out. I think you'll really like it. And thank you again for listening to this episode.